I started going with them to parties and then just kind of kind of came became this thing. <laughs> like, there's literally no story to it. <laughs> Hey everyone, my name is Tevin, also known as DJ Dapper. I'm 23 years old and I work at Death's Point Entertainment. I've been working there for eight years, so I started when I was 15. It was my cousin's wedding and uh, my dad gave me uh, family camera duty. I'm holding this big DSLR camera I have no idea how to use. And uh, from where Asad was DJing, there was a nice view of the ocean behind him. So I went up there to take a picture and uh, he saw me taking a picture, he gave me his card. He's like, do you mind sending me that picture? And I was like, yeah, no problem. So I go home the next day, send him the picture and just on a whim, it was like a quiet, nervous kid. I decided to ask him if he'd teach me how to DJ. And to this day, I have no idea why I asked, but I'm happy I did. And from there, it blossomed into uh, a very uh, fruitful relationship for sure. And uh, he's taught me a lot and I'm happy to have him in my life. My first year working at Decibel was in 2014. That was our first year as a company as well. And uh, at that time, I was a mere child. I was, how old was I in 2014? 17, I was a 17-year-old kid, um, just following us in the round of parties. And obviously, at that time, he was the one rocking parties and I was just watching. And uh, just the sheer excitement of wanting to be the guy that made all that happen really like lit a fire under me. And uh, over the next few years, I worked really hard to become a guy who was rocking receptions every Friday, Saturday, Sunday, all summer long. Uh, I have a picture of uh, the first time I set up a rig in my basement. I had my, uh, not a lot of people know this, but my, uh, my Mama G actually gave me my first set of uh, CDJs. And those, I still have those CDJs. And uh, I rented a Rain TTM 57 SL mixer. And there's a picture of that setup. I had my laptop on the side. and. Uh, crappy little Bose speaker on my desk. And that was my first, uh, my first rig, quote unquote. And then uh, the caption on that picture was 30 days to get pro. And needless to say, it took me a lot longer than 30 days to get pretty good at DJing, but it was, it was a start, that's for sure. Oh, I was, I was not comfortable on, in any public eye as a kid. And even now, I don't really like the public eye, but like, uh, some of my, like my sister sometimes jokes that uh, I have like two personalities. There's like Tevin and then there's like Dapper when he's on stage. And even now I refer to him as like somebody else because it is somebody else. Like I don't think that's me as like a person. Like when I'm up there I'm very confident. I have no problem going on the mic. But like if you told me to go say a speech in front of 600 people I'd be a thousand times more stressed than like telling everybody okay put your hands up or let's jump now or like when you're on stage you can't be a quiet DJ. Nobody wants to party if the guy on stage is just kind of timid, looking down, playing his stuff, and everybody's just trying to dance to that. I'm not gonna lie. I hung out with my nanny and my nana, and they've been more rowdy in 1115. So if you're tired, I don't care. We're gonna go, we're gonna go hard for the next hour. Here we go. really feeds off your energy and like music does really give me energy and I just had to figure out a way to express that energy through the mic and dancing on stage and once I got to do that DJ became a lot easier and the rest of my life became a lot easier too. The name DJ Dapper came from uh, actually the cousin whose wedding I met Usin at so when I first started DJing with Usin obviously first like year year and a half there's no no name you're just there trying to learn whatever you can and uh, one day there was a party that that cousin was at um, and we were all dressed up and he just said, wow, DJ Dapper. And to be honest, it just kind of stuck. And I probably owe him some royalties, but that's about it. <laughs> uh, FEs as a DJ. I feel like there's a lot. <laughs> one thing that really bugs me at a party, and this might be like not that exciting of a pet peeve, but I really don't like when people are doing speeches and there's people at the bar talking the whole time. I feel really bad for whoever's doing speech because I know that's a really stressful situation to be in and everybody's talking, then maybe the like few four or five tables in front or who's paying attention 
And man, I would not want to be that person giving a speech. That's a really random pet peeve of mine. But playing requests you don't like is uh, very, it's kind of an art form that Austin taught me about. There's always ways around playing songs that don't go with the party or not playing songs that people are requesting. So the quick solution is if the uncle asking for the song you think isn't gonna work, is uh, reasonable, which isn't always the case. <laughs> you can hope that's the case, but usually it's not. Um, sometimes you can reason with them, be like, Uncle, I don't think the song is gonna work, but like, is there something else I can play? Maybe that everybody else would be able to dance to as well. That's uh, one option. Sometimes it's a very close family member, like maybe it's the bride's dad or the groom's dad, and then at that point you really don't have a choice. You just have to go on the mic, you're like, the bride's dad requested this song, so we're gonna vibe to it for the next three or four minutes, and you just gotta rock it. And uh, fixing that three to four minutes of downtime, I guess, where people are like, I don't wanna dance to this, let's go get a drink, or let's go get food, or let's go to the photo booth, or whatever. Bringing the party back from that is the, the challenge per se, but it's a fun challenge, obviously. I'd say there was one party at Royal King, and this was actually my high school basketball coach's reception. And uh, it was cool because I knew a lot of people there and like I liked the music they liked so they liked a lot of like EDM and hip hop and they also liked uh, a lot of like old school rock music. And I still remember a basketball coach came up to me, his name was Randy. Randy came up to me, he asked for the mic because he wanted to sing while I was playing some Bon Jovi. And I distinctly remember in uh, Living on a Prayer is the part where they go, oh, we're halfway there. And Radeep had the mic, he's in the middle of the dance floor. I turned the music down while he's singing that part and it just had like, it was like perfectly out of tune singing, but it was very entertaining and I'll never forget that, that moment in that party. So quarantine for me, I think, uh, wasn't too different from uh, most people. It was actually the first, this summer was the first time since grade 10 and I'm now like five years out of high school that I didn't have work and I didn't have school. So I've had nothing but free time as the case for most people. So I spent a lot of my time doing mindless things. I played a lot of video games, played a lot of Call of Duty. I didn't, didn't do much of the baking bread. Obviously I tried the whipped coffee that everybody made. But uh, from a professional standpoint, I think it gave me a lot of time to work on my craft. I started learning how to produce music properly. I released my first remix actually this year because of COVID, so I guess you can, you can say it's not all bad. I think everything's an opportunity and if you see it that way, like COVID is definitely an opportunity for a lot of people. And so it's an opportunity to learn and I think I just took the time to try to learn new things during quarantine. So when I was younger and I first started doing out of town weddings, um, my parents didn't want me to go by myself because they were a little stressed out, like get lost in the airport or whatever. I didn't really like, wasn't really a really well traveled kid, like I didn't go anywhere by myself. So uh, one of the first ones I went to by myself was in California. And I still remember my sister came with me and we get to the hotel and it was, was not a nice hotel. Like <laughs> it like reeked of cigarettes and like we couldn't sleep. There was like spiders everywhere. And so we got there at night at maybe like nine or 10 o'clock at night and my gig was the next day and we couldn't sleep. So then I somehow managed to sleep a little bit because I had to work the next day, but my sister was awake calling around for other hotels to find us like another place to stay that was like a little bit more hospitable, I guess is the word I'm looking for. And uh, then there was being a big mistake, I guess the, the groom had booked a hotel that he thought he'd stayed at, but it was the wrong one. And it just was not as nice as the other one that he had stayed at. And uh, yeah, it all worked out in the end, but that was, uh, memorable for I guess the wrong reasons but that was my very first out of town wedding and uh, I think it led to Nadia getting to come to more weddings with me because of things going wrong and her kind of saving the day because that was just me up I was like whatever I'm here let's just sleep here call it a day <laughs> we can figure it out later but uh, yeah that was definitely one of the more memorable ones so uh, I've also been working on a, a side project I'd say that uh, is a little bit more of a passion project where I get to work on a little bit more music that I personally like as opposed to making like remixes of popular Punjabi songs. So a lot of my inspiration comes from big uh, EDM and dubstep and trap uh, artists like uh, Skrillex, RL Grime, Akali or a few that I personally really vibe with. 
So I've been making, or trying to make, it's a lot tougher than it seems, trying to make some uh, beats that sound like their music. And uh, let me tell you, it's a, it's a grind trying to learn how to make music properly. You gotta learn music theory, song structure, arrangement, mixing and mastering, and it's, it's definitely a, a marathon, not a sprint, but I'm, uh, I'm happy to be learning that marathon because I definitely can't run a real marathon. I never used to believe in concerts as a kid. I actually thought they were a waste of money. Why go listen to music live when I could just listen to it myself? And uh, man, as my perspective on that changed a lot. <laughs> so the first concert I went to was actually uh, a friend of mine took me to the Drake concert. And at that time, I didn't actually know a lot of like old school Drake. And at the Drake concert, he sang a lot of his old music that I didn't know and I didn't actually enjoy that concert all that much. And in my mind, that was like a confirmation of concerts being a waste of money. But uh, maybe like nine months to a year later, Kendrick is also one of my big inspirations uh, in the hip hop world, especially. And uh, he came to town on his damn tour in 2017. And uh, me and another one of my friends went to that concert. And that was what completely flipped the switch for me on whether concerts were worth it or not. Like, that was one of the most enjoyable experiences of my life. And then from there, I started going to some raves where I vibe with even more of that music. And I think my first rave was Contact 2019, I think it was. And man, the music these guys make is crazy. And it's like meant to like take you on this journey of like emotions, bring you up, bring you down. And it's a very beautiful thing to be a part of. And from there, I've been going to concerts and raves ever since. And, and let me tell you, it's worth the money. That's for sure. Especially now that we don't get to go anymore. I miss it a lot. <laughs>